So Sam doesn't have to go home alone. That's the main reason. What's the what's the secondary smaller reason? Hello, say goodbye to Frodo. I mean, he's not. They're not going to see Frodo anymore, or Bilbo for that matter. Okay. Uh, what does Sam do? He carries Frodo. Number four, number five, the two things Sam asked for if he could: water and light, and he gets them. Number six, who finally heals Eowyn? Oh. Yeah, I completely screwed that one up on my key. I was thinking when I read it, who who finally brings her back from her sleep? That's Aelmer. But that's not what I wrote for the question. It's Faramir. Hopefully we'll have time to spend on that. Um, yeah, I'll accept that. Because he only has one. <laughs> uh, number seven, who kills Sarah Man? Grima or Worm Tongue. Number eight, what is Sarah Man's other name? Sharky. Okay. Number nine, who does Gandalf say he can have a long talk with? Boy, I would love to be a fly on that wall. Because I kind of wonder if Gandalf goes in Hail Master, you know. If Tom Bombadil is who I think he made. The way that he talks about it, it kind of seems like he's referring to it that way. Yeah, he says, you know, we're going to have a talk like we haven't had in a long time. Um... Yeah, 10, who's the hero? Okay, it's open to interpretation. Is it Sam? Who's, who thinks it's Sam? Show me. Who thinks it's Frodo? Really? <laughs> Man, Frodo was so passive throughout the entirety of that. Who thinks it's Aragorn? Because some people have said Ar Aragorn's not. I mean, he's the return of the king, but he talked to Aragorn. I feel like it's just collectively the whole fellowship. It, kind of. We're all heroes. Right? Well, no, it's not that we're all here. Well, I mean. Everyone's a Pippin. <laughs> is Pippin necessary? They saved our morale. Yes. Well, I mean, he becomes very necessary. If Pippin hadn't dropped the rock down the well, yeah, take it to its logical conclusion, Bingo. what would not have happened? Bingo. Gandalf would not have come back. Why? Because Gandalf would not have died. If Gandalf would not have died, he would not have become Gandalf the White. If Gandalf the White did not become Gandalf the White, he wouldn't have been able to do everything. It kind of goes back to what Gandalf was saying about Gollum. Like, even the wise cannot see all ends. Oh, we don't know our place. We don't know our roles, etc., etc. There's a line in Hamlet. Just teaching Hamlet. There's a rough... There's a divinity that shapes our ends, Horatio. Rough hew them how we will. There's a divinity that shapes our ends. Ends their meaning both endings, completions of our life, and purposes. Rough hew them, that is, how we make the general cut. The language you're using is a, is a woodworking. So you take a log, you cut it down, and you get a broad axe, and you start hewing it. You take the bark off. You start making what is round into square, okay? So that's the hewing. That's the rough hewing. The shaping is taking that rough thing and maybe turning it into a beautiful sculpture. So God does this shaping while we rough hew. And what Shakespeare is dealing, there, dealing with there is this idea of synergy. That we go along down here doing our own little bit in the world. Meanwhile, God's up here doing his bit and unbeknownst to us, we're working in tandem. I don't think I, I mentioned this in the lecture that you hopefully watched. I'm <laughs> bringing it up at the last day of class. The Boethian idea, okay, based upon Boethius, a 5th century, I believe, Roman. Um, and it's very, it's very, very appropriate, which is why I mentioned it in, in that first lecture that I um, had on video. Um, let's finish the quiz, and then I'll go into this. Uh, Tom Bombadil, who's the hero, Frodo or Sam? Who rescues Frodo and Sam? The eagles. Why hear the wind lord? Why hear the eagle? He's the one who does it. Gandalf sends him. Okay, Because Gandalf knows. As soon as the armies are all kind of go, mm, one. 
Okay. Um, who does Frodo say he and Gollum? He and Gollum should forgive. Gollum. <laughs> okay. Who let Saruman out of the tower? Tree beard. Damn fool. Because <laughs> he's so nice. Uh, in five, four, why does Frodo leave Middle Earth? To heal. He cannot be healed here. He's got two wounds? Three wounds. Three wounds that cannot be healed. One, Morgul Blade, when he was stabbed on Weathertop, every October 6th, he's sick. Okay. Two, Bite Wound, every March, I don't remember the exact date, he, you know, sick and in bed, and then he walks around like this for the rest of it, because they don't do a prosthetic, you know, it's not like Voldemort puts a plastic, you know, silver finger on him, okay? Or <clears throat> Gandalf. This is in Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> so, yeah, or Star Wars. Who's the new king? Excuse me. Yeah. You're, okay. Back to Boethius for a <clears throat> Early on in the chapter Shadow of the Past, when Gandalf tells Frodo he was meant to have the ring, okay, Frodo's like, uh, how do you mean? Okay. Well, that term meant implies there's something meaning, there's something that intends Frodo to have the ring. We're never told within the Lord of the Rings what that is. It's, it's clear if you look at the Lord of the Rings as part of a much, much larger cosmology, the whole world of Middle Earth, that's Eru Iluvatar. Or maybe. <clears throat> His representative in Valinor, Manwe. Okay? So, Boethius was a 5th century AD. Uh, I don't remember if he's a senator or not. He was pretty high ranking and he was good friends with the Roman emperor in the West at that time because Rome was divided into the East and West, who was a German whose name was Theodoric. Okay? And Somebody told Theodoric that Boethius is conspiring against you. Okay? Plotting against you. So he had Boethius arrested and put in jail. Now, Boethius and Theodoric, I think I said, were good friends. So Boethius gets thrown into prison, death row, and he's like, what the? Why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve this? It's kind of like, why did this thing come to me? Frodo asked. Okay? Well, while in prison, he writes a book. <clears throat> the book is called The Consolation of Philosophy. Sounds really boring, right? <clears throat> it's the most important book written in the Middle Ages. It is the most frequently referred to and the most, most widely copied book. Outside, like the Bible, okay, in the Middle Ages, all right? Consolation of philosophy, what does that mean? Does that mean he sits down and he picks up his Plato and goes, oh, I feel better? No. Philosophy in the book is the goddess philosophy. Wisdom, if you want. Love of wisdom. Who comes to him while he's in prison because he's like, why is this happening to me? And she says, sit down and I'll tell you. Okay. And she kind of deals with some of the trite things. Oh, it's all part of a great plan. No, that's not what she says. But she does say, what is happening to you is all part of God's providence. That's a, a particular theological word that means God's governance of everything. Everything that happens. Like the ring falling off Gollum's finger while he's sneaking around in the mountain, only to have Bilbo stumble upon it, you know, days, whatever later. Right? But while she's talking about it, she mentions two other things. Fate and fortune. Right? Fortune is what governs what happens here on Earth. That's why we talk about people have good fortune, they have bad fortune. It's because the goddess, fortune, the sub-goddess, if you want, fortune, she's calling the shots here, Lady Fortune, right? So she's spinning her wheel, Vanna White's over there, you know, doing the letters for everybody, 
And sometimes you're going upwards in fortune. Things are looking up. Okay? And sometimes you're going down in fortune. All right? Unfortunately. <laughs> but that's down here on earth. Outside earth, fate is in control. See, fortune doesn't have any control over fate. Fate can control fortune. This is based upon the Greek model of the universe, right? Where's God in this? God's back here. See, in the Greek model, God is fate. No, it's not that the God is God's our fate. It's that the fate is equal to in power to the gods, mm -hmm. which is why in the, the, the great play by Sophocles, Oedipus and King. Right? Oedipus can receive a prophecy that is told to him by the gods about what's going to happen in the future. Why? Because the gods know what fate dictates. Fate is whatever's going to happen. It's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. If, if you're a real fatalist, if you really believe in this kind of Greek system, it was fated what you put on for your clothing this morning. It was fated what you ate. Fated from when? From the Big Bang forward. Everything exists. It's just one giant pool table, and the Big Bang was merely the breaking of the rack. And everything still moving. Yes. So basically, fortune would be the vehicle by which fate occurs. Kind of, down here. But fate doesn't always intervene. Right? So, the gods see what fate has in store. The gods can't change fate. And fate doesn't govern the gods. The gods are outside of fate. Right? Now, in the Christian tradition, God is out here. Because all of this, that's all part of the so-called universe. That is, the Greek gods are within this as is fate. God, the Christian idea of God, is totally outside of it. Totally separate from it. Alright? And he does what? He's the one who providences it, let's say. Controls, rules. How so? Well, if you were in my previous class, the other day we were talking about Calvinism and such. So I'm going to leave all this, take all this part off for a moment. And Calvinists in the Protestant Christian tradition tend to argue pretty strongly for the theological doctrine called predestination. Yeah. That is, according to a good strict Calvinist, I used to be one, used to be a pretty strict one, you know, you'd say, save, 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 rest you go to hell. That's it. That's what's called unconditional election. Notice, did nothing to deserve it, did nothing to deserve it, did nothing to deserve it. And the rest of you did nothing to deserve going to hell, by the way. But I just chose those three. Notice, three out of approximately 20. Why only three? Because according to Calvin's idea, the vast majority of people who ever lived end up in hell. It's a small number that go to hell, okay? What's it based upon? It's based upon several texts in Scripture that talk about before the foundations of the world, I chose you. Before the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. The election, etc., etc. All right? So, go back to Boethius for a moment. Boethius is looking at his life. Okay? Birth, death, let's say, imprisonment. Which means this is moving closer. <laughs> and he experiences life like every one of us does. How so? Tick tock. Tick tock. That is, we experience it moment by moment, linearly, right? We experience it in our daily interaction. What do we not get an opportunity to do? Okay, pause. <laughs> Because that'd be nice every now and then. 
What else? Go back. Go back. Okay. What else? What can we not see about our lives? Or I can think of Maybe you can. I'm deaf, dumb, dumb and blind. I can't. We don't get to see this. Let me rephrase this. We see this from our perspective. Like this. Right? Because five minutes from now, get where are you going to be? Right. Exactly where you are, sitting in hell, right? So <laughs> making your way down, now. down this line. What do we not see? We don't see it from this perspective. Mm. We don't see it from the top down. We see it like little bugs scurrying through our lives. Okay? Here's what philosophy taught. Boethius. Think of God like God is portrayed on the dollar bill. Dollar bill? That oh. Triangle? Uh, uh, you mean that's not the Illuminati? Yeah, well, okay, go there too. <laughs> what is this? The all seeing eye, you can go all, you know, which one is it? Emerson, I became the all seeing eye, and all that kind of nonsense. It's the, what we kind of call the bird's eye view. Mm. But it's the God's eye view. But what's the God's eye view? Let me change the angle of that. Because <clears throat> everything here is in time. God is e terminal, outside time. You know, think about this for a moment. Outside time implies what? If you're outside time and looking in time, what do you see? Forward, backwards, yeah. Everything. When? Oh. Now. What is happening? Well, just like whenever we like be, it, be like time travel vision, basically. No, I mean whoever said it back here. Forward, backward, window, now. Because you're looking in it, and it's it's everything. Okay? It, it's everything from beginning to end. Well, let's go real beginning to end. Use the New Testament language. From before the foundations of the world, Christ was crucified. Well, what does that mean? Before the foundations of the world, Christ was, according to traditional Christian theology. Well, why was he crucified? Because before the foundations of the world, what? That is before anything was made. Not that he was chosen. Okay, keep going. But he was only crucified what? According to Christian theology. Because Adam and Eve screwed up and passed that on. So, before anything happened, it was all known. Now, the way predestination is usually talked about is God dealt the cards. And you get the cards you dealt with. Rather than the Boethian perspective is, it's all known. It's not that God says, you will. It's, this is just what's going to happen. Because God has seen it. Notice Gandalf says, not even the very wise can see all ends. The implication there is, Gandalf has a little ladder. Because <laughs> he's very wise. So he can see what? See, I'm here. I'm like a flea. I can see this far. <laughs> Gandalf, because he's very wise, he can get up and see a little bit longer perspective. Well, who's even wiser than Gandalf? Was in the Lord of the Rings? Nobody. I don't even think, eh, maybe go ahead, but I don't think so. You got to go outside the Lord of the Rings and maybe go to Valinor, Munwe, who is the king of the air. So if he's the king of the air, that obviously raises his ladder a bit. So he sees even more. Go even farther back, Iri Malubitar. And this. If you've never read the Silmarillion, read the Silmarillion, okay? Because 
it, it's the best thing Tolkien wrote, even though he didn't complete it. Because of this, the creation story and the quote-unquote fall story, which is entirely based on Christian theology, but it's how he does it, okay? He has the order... <laughs> <laughs> he, he, has yeah, what, he has what are called the Ainur, who I've talked about before, who, if they enter down into Arda, become the Valar and the Maiar, okay? He creates them, and then he tells them, sing. They're all singers. I got a bunch of CDs, singers and songwriters of the 70s. So they're a bunch of singers and songwriters, right? right? And he tells them to sing. And each one sings something differently. But, when they sing, it'd be like everybody in this room, in this room, all right now, suddenly belting out a song. Which I don't know about you, but to me would probably sound like this. Okay. But in the Silmarillion, it's like Beethoven's fifth. In fact, it's like the end to Beethoven's ninth, the Ode to Joy chorale at the end. Everything is beautiful except for one part. The character of Melkor, who doesn't like the theme, and he decides to introduce, okay, and that happens three times. See, but when they're singing, they think they're just singing. They're just there to please Uru Iluvatar. And they finish their singing, and he goes, okay, now let me show you what you've just done. And what they've just done is they've just created the world and all of its history. All of its history. That is, everything that's going to happen was sunk, with one exception. What we, we, only humans, do. Everybody else is essentially predestined, fated to do what they do. We are not. We're the only ones who were told have total free will. We can choose to do other. Okay? Is that now in, in terms of like of you know that universe or whatever, when you say like humans, do you mean just like man? Humanity. Yeah. Okay. Not elves, not okay. dwarves, not hobbits. Okay. Men of Numenor who come later. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Which is why it's so important when they screw up. When they listen to the false gods Melkor, Sauron, wannabe, Saruman, etc. Okay? So the consolation that Boethius receives is. Oh, okay. Because the consolation she gives Boethius is Boethius, if you can, take yourself out of your situation and rise up above and look down. And there's a wonderful depiction of this, in, of this idea, in, um, I'm trying to remember the author's name, Chronicles of Perdain, by, <clears throat> Lloyd Alexander, okay? Where the character Terran, the hero of the five series, the five books in the series, he meets up with these three old ladies. They're the fates, by the way or Norns, and he sees in their cottage a loom where there's a piece of fabric on, but it doesn't make any sense, okay? Well, partly the reason it doesn't make any sense is because he hasn't lived long enough because the fabric that is on that loom, it's his life. He's not made enough decisions, choices, etc., etc. Also, it's like he's seeing if, if we were able to take Camille sweat and turn it inside out. It probably, I'm not sure about this, but it probably wouldn't have the same pattern on the outside as it does on the inside. <laughs> take a piece of, take a tapestry, right? And look at the outside of the tapestry, the part that you're designed to look at, and you're like, wow, that's really beautiful. How did they do that? And then you flip it over, and it doesn't make any sense. Well, the part that doesn't make any sense Maybe it does to you. It's this. Like, what the hell am I doing? Why is my life, everything, I just, you know, make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. Or, 
what's the purpose? What's the grand idea? Well, because you're going along this way and you don't see the connections. Gandalf tells Frodo what in the chapter Shadow of the Past about Gollum. I cannot see all ends, but he says, I hope for his cure and my heart tells, not his reason, my gut tells me he has some part to play. It's not because he's been out here and he sees it. Unless maybe when he dies, which is later in the book, you know. Then he goes out, oh, now I understand. Okay. So well, wouldn't that mean that if he did see it all, that he knows that Gollum's the one that actually like warned and destroyed the ring, not for Um, could be, because if I remember right, the language he uses, let's just jump forward for a moment. That's the... Faramir talking with... Where is it? Where's the page where Gandalf says, that's it. The ring's destroyed. Um... It's in the chapter, The Steward of the King, which we're not at quite yet. So Faramir wants to marry Eowyn. Oh, we'll find it when we go through, maybe. So, we're going to pick up with, and I lost my place, Mount Doom. There it is. Page 944. Where are you taking your quiz? I ran off to my room, my office, and grabbed this, but not yet until that today. Um, <laughs> As if we would ever do 944, bottom of the page. We left off with Gollum saying to Sam, don't kill us yet. Okay? Don't kill us. And Sam's hand wavers, his mind was hot with wrath, the memory of evil. It would be just to slay this treacherous, murderous creature, just and many times deserved. And it seemed the only safe thing to do. But deep in his heart, something tells him no. Why? What tells him no? Is it mercy? I mean, yeah, it is. What else is it? Why does he experience that mercy? Why does he feel mercy towards Gollum? Or show mercy? Because he won the ring. He held the power of the ring back. <clears throat> For how long? Well, he didn't wear it. Well, he, he well, wore it around his neck. But, but he did wear it for a time. He did put it on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But even even then, how long did he have the ring? No, it's longer than that. I think it's a day or so. But it's a day or so. And Gollum had it six hundred years. So in that little flash of time, compared to Gollum's, Sam understands what Gollum is experiencing. Frodo said, "Chapter of the Shadow of the Past." No, and I do not want to see him. I'm afraid. He saw him, and he said, "Now I do pity him." So. We're told at the end of that paragraph that began, Sam's hand wavered. He himself, though only for a little while, had borne the ring, and now dimly he guessed the agony of Gollum's shriveled mind and body, enslaved to that ring, unable to find peace or relief. Does Tolkien end the sentence there? No. Ever in life again. By by narrowing it, by restricting the peace and relief to ever in life again, I think Tolkien is intending us to understand he might find peace and relief, but not here. You mouthed it in death. In death. That is, death might be Gollum's release 
from pain and, and agony. And I don't mean release in the sense of, you know, his atoms will just dissolve and he'll whatever, okay? But Sam, noticed had no words to express what he was feeling. Why? Because Sam's not supposed to be that bright. His name, Samwise. Sam, in Old English, if I remember right, is wisdom. Excuse me, Sam is half. Wise is wisdom. Half wise. <laughs> I'm not quite dealing with a full deck. All right? So he can't put what he's thinking into words. Oh, curse you, you stinking thing. Go away, be off. So Sam lets him go. Okay? Sam scampers up after Frodo. He sees Frodo there on the brink of the crack of doom. Page 945. He calls out, Master, kind of interesting, by the way, because that can mean Lord, what he's going to bow down to. <coughs> and Frodo says, Then Frodo stirred and spoke <coughs> with a clear voice. Why with a clear voice? Because has Frodo been speaking with a clear voice up until this point? No, he hardly whispers because he's so weak. Now he's he speaks. Not, he's, not fighting. he's not fighting anymore. Keep going, Jonathan. Take one more step. The ring has, the ring has taken over. Bingo! He now has the power of, the, not the power that Sauron would be able to have, that he hasn't, Frodo hasn't gotten there and gone, oh, I know how to use the ring. I have a You know, where he unlocks all of its hidden secrets in a moment of time. No. But now he's gone. The ring is taking control. And he says, with a voice clearer and more powerful than Sam had ever heard him use. And it rose above the throb and turmoil of Mount Doom, ringing in the roof and walls. So this is little, probably somewhat high-pitched Frodo, now resounding with this deep bass voice. Louder than the volcano. Okay? I have come, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. Notice, he also kind of takes on theatrical airs. I mean, he starts to speak in actor speak. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. And he just happens to say that where? Well, there's the crack of doom. Okay? And the crack of doom, and where, they're, where they are, the cave leads out. And it's not the kind of thing where you have to wander inside and go around all kinds of turns. It leads straight out, and if you stand where, like Frodo is standing, and turn and face the entrance of the cave, and if you can see far enough, what do you see? Barandur. There's Sauron's tower. Hundreds of miles north. And suddenly, as he set it on his finger, he vanished from Sam's sight, Sam gasped. He had no chance to cry out. Why? Because many things happen. One, he gets knocked on the back of the head. His legs are knocked from under him. He's flung aside. He lay still for a moment and all went black. That is, he passes out. And far away, as soon as Frodo put the ring on his finger and claimed it for his own, the power of Barad-dur was shaken. Now, that might be metaphorical. It might be literal. Metaphorically, what does it mean? Sauron does what at that point? Two words. Ends with O and ends with it. <laughs> Begins with O and ends with it. Oh, sh <laughs> Literally, if it's true, then that means when Frodo claims the ring, Baradur suffers an earthquake. Why? Because the whole weight of the edifice of the tower now resides in the palm of a midget <laughs> at the edge of the lava fissure where it can be destroyed. The Dark Lord was suddenly aware of him, and his eye piercing all shadows looked across the plain to the door he had made. Notice, the door he had made. He didn't make the mountain, but he carved and dug the opening and the magnitude of his own folly, folly is foolishness. Damn, I'm stupid. Wow. 
Why did I do that? Was revealed. And all the devices of his enemies were at last laid bare. And he's like, you know, you <laughs> bested me again, you know. And from all his policies and webs of fear and treachery, from all the stratagems and wars in his mind, he, he shakes all that free. And when he shakes all that free, and he turns from this way, looking northwards towards the black gate, where all of his forces are pouring out, and he does this. Notice, by the way, literally that's repenting. <laughs> He's not repenting, however. He turns, and what happens to everybody out here? They kind of go, you know, they all go limp. They're all, they lose their will. Their will is his will forced upon them. Tolkien says in the fairy story essay, the difference between the enchanter, the person who writes fairy stories, and the magician is the enchanter wants what's called shared enrichment. Like you see an absolutely beautiful sunset and you go inside and you go, come here, you gotta, you gotta see this. Why? Because you think it will enrich that person. Okay? Or you see a film or you read a book, you, oh, you gotta read this film. Okay? That's the, the idea behind enrichment. The magician says you will like this and puts an order on you, puts a command on you. Think the imperious curse. Okay? The magician, Tolkien says, is all about power. All about power. What's Sauron want? He wants to be worshipped. Why? Because of his power. That's it. Okay? So, he realizes the eight riders that are left, they start flying. <laughs> but they can't get there instantaneously. Notice you could do a great mashup, Lord of the Rings and Star Trek. Have them get in a transporter. Yeah, and they're there. But of course, there'd have to be a transporter there too. So, Sam wakes up. He notices the mountain starting to shake. How do I know? The fires below awoke in anger. The red light blaze is great glare and heat. And Sam sees Gollum's long hands draw upwards to his mouth. So Gollum's hands do this. Because Gollum's struggling with something. And he sees his white fangs gleam and then bite down. And there's Frodo with his hand in Gollum's mouth. Okay. Frodo gives a cry. Gollum, dancing like a mad thing, holds aloft the ringer. The ringer with a thing still in it. The ring with a finger still in it. It shone now as if verily it was rock of living fire. Precious, 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 Gollum cries. My precious, oh my precious. <laughs> and with that, even as his <coughs> eyes were lifted up to gloat on his prize, he stepped too far, toppled, wavered for a moment on the brink, and then with a shriek he fell. And precious, you know, okay. A roar, great confusion of noise, fires leaped up. Why? Gollum's gone, the ring is gone. Okay. And Sam says, well, this is the end. Uh, Frodo says, this is the end, Sam. What does Frodo mean, this is the end? Yeah, this, this is the end, Sam. Because <laughs> the mountain's going to erupt. He doesn't know this literally, but the mountain's going to erupt, and we're going to be, you know, Vesuvius. We're literally right next to the lava, right? Okay. And there's Frodo, pale and worn, but himself. And Sam falls on his knees. In all that ruin of the world, for the moment, he felt only joy, great joy. The burden was gone. Joy, great joy. You catastrophe. What, what's the you catastrophe? What's the miraculous grace never to be recounted on, counted on to recur? Well, gone can't come back. <laughs> it's not like he's going to find a little hidden tunnel and they're going to replay it. It's not Groundhog Day. Okay? Your poor hand. And I have nothing to bind it with or comfort. I would have spared him a whole hand of mine, rather. But he's gone now beyond recall, gone forever. Yes, says Frodo. And do you remember? And he's like, you know, 
thinking of good old days. But for him, Sam, I could not have destroyed the ring. Think about that sentence for a moment. Yes. Okay, so I have a question. So earlier it seemed like Gollum um, knew that he was going to complete the quest, but then here it seems like it was an accident. Okay, what do you mean by complete the quest? You mean that he knew he was going to die? Yeah. Because those are two different things. We, yeah. had, we had talked about... Hold on. Oh, and we had <laughs> talked about last class. Yeah. Uh, right. When Gollum says, you know... Just a little longer, once the ring precious goes, I'll be gone. Yeah. Right? Um, I was so going to talk about that. I, I don't know. I'm just confused. Did, did he know that he was... Well, going to Yeah, because he said that. But then it's... I don't know. I'm, I'm a little confused. Okay. Jacob? You said that, um, that, like, basically, he was probably thinking, like, once the ring is destroyed, he's going to die with it, because the ring was what was keeping him alive. Okay. That's... Well, Possibly true. I, I was sort of thinking it was along the lines because he knew he made a promise to the ring and the ring was going to hold him to it. He knew he was going to try to take the ring and the ring, it, it was pretty much told if he did, he was going to die. So he was going to try and die either way. Yeah, I mean, and Sam, or not Sam, Frodo specifically told him if he tried, he would fall into the... If you ever touch me again, you will be destroyed. Right. The ring, or whatever the gave, voice is... Yeah, he gave a specific how he would be yeah. Too. Yeah. In Go. the lava or fire. It's kind of funny, even because like the ring holding Gollum to his oath is also holding the ring to that like oath of, as well. Like, oh, he's got the ring. He went, you know, took the ring, so he's going to have to be killed. I, I'm going with him because of that. Which is because he swore directly to the ring, yeah. not to Frodo, not to Sauron, yeah, yeah. to the ring itself, and so the ring. 940, bottom of 943, top of 944. Down, you creepy thing, out of my path. Your time is at an end. You cannot betray me or slay me now. Then suddenly, Sam sees Frodo and Gollum as if a different vision, and he hears the voice come out of the wheel of fire at Frodo's breast. Be gone and trouble me no more. If you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom. Now, if that's the ring, okay, big conditional if, the voice comes out of the ring of fire at Frodo's breast. Okay? So the ring really can bend itself. Interesting, interesting thought. Which kind of possibly ties into all this kind of stuff that I was just talking about. Are you a suicidal before. ring? So, the ring says you will be cast into the fire. Now, go back to what Frodo says. But for him, Sam, I could not have destroyed the ring. What does the but for him mean? If it weren't for Gollum, I couldn't have destroyed the ring. He didn't even destroy the ring. He didn't destroy the ring. Frodo did not destroy the ring. Frodo did not even get the ring to Mount Doom. <laughs> Sam did. How? Because he carried him part of the way. He carried him part of the way up Mount Doom. He kept him alive the whole way. Okay. This is why I think Jocelyn's, you know, suggestion, maybe the entire fellowship is the hero, is significant. Because everybody in the fellowship has their part to play. Even Boromir. Where did Boromir significantly play a major part? It's something I never talk about. When you're trying to take the ring. That's okay, before then. A positive part. Um, a really positive part. On the mountain? On Mount Carathras, before they go into the mines of Moria. Right? He, carries, he helps carry them. He digs them out through the snow. He and Aragorn. The two men. You know... Gandalf, somebody says, Gandalf, come on, man, fire. He's like, got to have something to burn. It's not like Peter Jackson. I, I don't know the Peter, because I don't remember this at all in the films. But you would think some idiot producer, director, would have him get his, you know, staff and suddenly turn it into the flamethrower o you know, and melt all them. But he doesn't do that. 
you hurt? I think he just preferred having Legolas dance on the snow. <laughs> <laughs> He's light-footed. I mean, okay, we're, we're elves and fairies. Cool. So, we're, he says, but for him, Sam, I could not have destroyed the ring. The quest would have been in vain, even at the bitter end. The bitter end. It's bitter for Frodo. Right? So, let us forgive him. For the quest is achieved, and now all is over. All? My life, your life, we're dead, Sam. But the quest is achieved. Yee! Everybody back in the Shire, they live fat, dumb, and happy, and totally unaware of anything that has gone on out here. I'm glad you're here with me here at the end. I'm glad you're dying with me, Sam. <laughs> if there's anyone that wanted to die with me, it's you, Sam. So, chapter four, Field of Cormala. This is where it is. The Nazgul suddenly turn and flee. All the captains of the West cried out. Bottom of page 948. For their hearts were filled with a new hope in the midst of darkness. Notice they don't know why. Out from the beleaguered hills, knights of Gondor, riders of Rowan, Dunedain of the north, close carried companies, blah, 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 and Gandalf says, stand men of the west, stand and wait. This is the hour of doom. Because Gandalf, at that point, it's not like he has a sudden insight, but he knows it can go one of two ways. And even as he spoke, the earth rocks. That is, there's a big old stinking earthquake. Rising swiftly up, far above the towers of the Black Eight, high above the mountains, a vast soaring darkness sprang into the fire. Now, visually, what does that mean? Literally, some black thing rises up out of Mordor, higher than the mountains, higher than Baradur, and the earth keeps quaking, and the towers of the gate collapse. The wall collapses. It's a beautiful wall. <laughs> it totally destroyed. The realm of Sauron is ended. Gandalf looks at that and goes, I'm going to read the signs. <laughs> Sauron's gone. The ring bearer has fulfilled his quest. Does Gandalf know it's Frodo? No, but who was the last one to have the ring? It was Frodo. Frodo did bear the ring. Bingo. The ring bearer fulfilled the quest. Because whoever had the ring. <laughs> and they gazed south to the land of Mordor, and it seemed to them that black against the pall of cloud, there rose a huge shape of shadow, impenetrable, lightning crowned, filling all the sky. Look at videos sometimes of when there's a major volcanic eruption. Especially if it's at night. Totally cool. Because you'll see all the lightning at the top of the ash cloud. Okay. I don't know that Tolkien has that in mind. I doubt that he's ever seen an image of a volcanic eruption. Anyways, so the men of the south, Far Harad and Rune and such, they throw it on their arms. We have, they didn't want to fight. Okay. Orcs continue for a while. So, we're going to skip a bunch. Um, skip a whole bunch. Let's see. Uh, chapter 5, Steward and the King. What time is it? 10.37. Shoot. <laughs> told myself we'd finished it. Time had is your had to go time. all Boethius. <laughs> It's okay. There's a great reason for everything. It would be a you know? <laughs> ever um, <laughs> so, steward and the king. Fear mirrors walking in the houses of healing. And Eowyn's allowed to come out of her room. She comes out. Fear mirror tells her, page 960, I'm in the warden's keeping. In other words, I'm a captive here too. Because <laughs> warden there, kind of like warden of a penitentiary. They won't let us go. Okay? And he says, um, I can't do anything, but, you know, if you want, I can ask for you to be able. She says, I don't desire healing. 
I wish to ride to war like my brother Elmer, or better like Fade and the King. Why? He's dead? For he died and has both honor and peace. I mentioned Oedipus the King. Anybody know how Oedipus the King ends? The, the very last line of the play? Count no man happy till he dies free of pain at last. That's, that's kind of an adequate summation of how Eowyn feels at this point. Okay? Fearmer says, too late for you to ride out with your brother. They've already left. He says, no, you and I, we must endure with patience the hours of waiting. Notice, endure, patience, waiting. They all three essentially mean the same thing. Put a whole bunch of cookies and candy and stuff in front of a five-year-old and say, wait. What are you telling that kid to do? Endure. Endure. Suffer. <laughs> Suffer. Be patient. The patient in patient comes from passio. Like the passio, the passion of the Christ. It means to really to suffer. Okay? I'm sure so, that this is like the ultimate battle and she probably knows as well it doesn't help. Yeah, I'm, she's thinking, oh man, this was the mother of all battles. Yeah. I mean, I could have I died really, they really well. They finished the war without me. Okay. So he says, no, you have to wait. But he says, I, you know, we can make things a little easier. So Mary goes to Faramir and such, and we're going to skip a bunch. So the warden lets them go out into the garden. And Faramir says, let's see, page 262. He asks her, what are you looking for, Eowyn? And she's looking out north. She uh, south, does not the black gate lie yonder? Must he not now become thither? It's seven days since he rode away. Now, he's talking about her brother. He says, seven days? But let me tell you, if I say to you, they have, that is, these seven days, have brought me both a joy and a pain that I never thought to know. Joy to see you, but pain, because now the fear and doubt of this evil time are grown dark indeed. Joy, because I finally met you. Okay. Pain, because we're going to die. <laughs> and when I would not have this world end now or lose so soon what I have found. Lose what you have found, Lord? I, I know not what in these days you have found that you could lose. But come, my friend, let us not speak of it. Oh, she used that killer of all romance. <laughs> friend. Behold, it's like, you know, I'll just go ahead and slit my throat now. <laughs> let us not speak of, let us not speak at all. I stand upon some dreadful brink and it is utterly dark in the abyss before my feet. Ooh. She says, I'm at the abyss. And what does she see ahead of her? Nothing. Darkness. What's that a description of? Okay, possibly. Despair. That is an image of despair. Sees no light at all. But whether there is any light behind me, I can't tell. Why not? Because her implication is she can't turn around. What she's implying is her path is laid this way and this way alone, that she can't repent. What is she said so far in almost every conversation we've heard from her? What is she more than anything else? A warrior. A shield maiden. Okay. I cannot turn yet. I wait for some stroke of doom. That is, here's the abyss. I can't turn yet. I'm waiting. She's implying. I might be able to, but I'm waiting for something. Some stroke of doom. Now, usually stroke of doom, doom there means judgment. Stroke kind of implies slashing, <laughs> like off with her head. Fairmer, yes, we do wait for the stroke of doom. 
but they don't say anything more. And it seemed to them as they stood upon the wall that the wind died, the light failed, the sun was bleared, all sounds in the city or in the lands, of, lands about. In other words, it's like time stops. Neither wind nor voice nor bird call nor rustle of leaf, time halted. And as they stood so, their hands meet and clasp. Is this Tolkien being a romantic sucker? I don't think so. Why do their hands meet and clasp? Look at what comes. Though they did not know it. And still they waited, for they knew not what. Then presently it seemed to them that above the ridges of the distant mountains, another vast mountain of darkness rose. They see off in the distance this darkness rise. And then... It blows away. What did they had an experience when Gandalf led him outside his great golden hall of Metaselt? It's not so dark out here. And he gets the shaft of light from behind him. Notice she's out and she says metaphorically, there's nothing but darkness. And I can't turn around yet. Okay? The darkness rose, towering up like a wave that should engulf the world, and about it lightning flickered, and then a tremor runs through the earth. They feel even Minas Tirith shake. Faramir says, it reminds me of Numenor. you got to read the Silmarillion and understand what that means. It means the fall of Numenor, which is Tolkien's Atlantis story. The fall, the subsuming of the island in the ocean. Amen. And she says, what? <laughs> and he tells her, then you think that the darkness is coming? That is, he sees that and he thinks the darkness is coming this direction. And he says, uh, no. Because she says, you think the darkness is coming? Darkness unescapable? Okay, they're both holding hands, but they're unaware and she draws closer to him. That is, she's holding on to him. <clears throat> How does she draw closer? She pulls. What does he become at that point? Like an anchor. Right? An anchor symbolically has been used from the Middle Ages on as an image of hope. Why? Because it roots you. It doesn't allow you to flounder. It ties you to something real. Okay? So, he says, no. It was but a picture in the mind. I don't know what's happening. The reason of my waking mind tells me some great evil has befallen. And, and here we are at the end of the day. But my heart says no. Notice, mind and, reason, uh, mind and heart, reason and heart, not sinking. Okay? But he says... And a hope and joy are come to me that no reason can deny. His heart is telling him that. And then he says, Eowyn, Eowyn, white lady of Rowan, in this hour I do not believe that any darkness will endure. And he stoops and kisses her. Why does he stoop? Because he's tall. She's probably not short. Okay? If you're going to film this, you can't get a five foot one actress. She needs to be probably five nine, five ten two. I, one, she wants to be a shield maiden, and two, she comes from a long line of kings. You just got to do it right. So they stand there, and an eagle comes bearing news. Okay. Bottom of 964. Middle of 964. Top of 964. Faramir asks, why are you still here? She's been given leave to go. Why aren't you go? Why aren't you off at the field of Kermolin? Do you not know? Two reasons. I don't know the right one. Notice two reasons why she might be staying. Okay? And he's like, but I don't want to guess. What if I guess the wrong one? She says, I don't want to play riddles. Speak plainer. Okay, here we go. 
you don't go because only your brother called for you. And you want to look at Aragorn. That is, Aragorn didn't call you. Okay. So you're not going because you don't want to see Aragorn again. Ilindil's heir and all of his triumph, you know, all of his finery and, you know. Or you don't go because I don't go. And you desire still to be. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like. And maybe for both these reasons, and you don't know which of them is true. So there's actually a third possibility. He's really hedging his bets here. <laughs> and then he finally says, Eowyn, do you not love me? Or will you not? What's the difference between do and will? Do is now, will is, might you in the future? What can I do to earn, to change that from a do to a will? I wished to be loved by another. And he's like, oh, cool. Bad answer. But I desire no man's pity. He's like, yeah, I get that. You desire to have the love of the Lord Aragorn. Why? Because he was high. And it's one of the only times Tolkien uses a specifically, particularly French word. Puissant. Powerful. Why? Because Aragorn is nothing but King Arthur in Middle Earth clothing. And King Arthur is largely a French creation. Largely. Not entirely, but I mean, the, the kernel of the myth is British. Not English, British. It's before there is an England. But it really gets blown up by the French. So, and why? Because he's high and powerful. And you wish to have renown and glory. In other words, you wanted to be a snotty, you know what, queen. Ruling people, looking down your nose. And as a great captain made to a young maiden, he seemed to you admirable. For so he is, Lord among men, greatest that now is. But when he gave you only understanding and pity, then you desired to have nothing. Then you looked into the black pit. Because you couldn't have Aragorn. Okay. So, because you couldn't have the greatest, most powerful, hottest man in the world, you wouldn't take number two. That's essentially where he's the shop going. Leave me alone. Um, they were like, obviously, right? number two is me. So, he then says, look at me, Eowyn. Okay. So you have Aragorn in your mind's eye, and where is that? In your mind's eye. That is, your image of Aragorn is what? It's really important because it ties in with the Lord of the Rings, with Harry Potter really well. It's your image of Aragorn. She's turned Aragorn from a flesh and blood living man into an idol. All right? So he says, look at me. Why? Maybe a little wart over here. Hair's not perfect, you know. One eye maybe droops a little bit, okay? <laughs> Kidding. He's got bad breath. <laughs> and Eowyn looks at Faramir long and steadily, and he finally says, Do not scorn pity that is the gift of a gentle heart. She said, I don't want any man's pity. And he said, I know. And now he says, Yet I do pity you. Okay? What's the pity from? His gentle heart. But I do not offer you my pity, for you are lady high and valiant, and have yourself one renown. In other words, okay, so there is some pity from my gentle heart, but that's not why I love you. Why do I love you? Because you are high, valiant, not high, but you know, you are noble. <laughs> You're noble. I mean, she might smoke weed. Who knows? Everybody <laughs> smokes weed in this world. So... Hi, Valiant, have yourself won renown. What renown? You killed the she witch. killed the Witch King of Angmar. Aragorn didn't. He couldn't. He couldn't. Okay. So he says, And you are a lady beautiful, I deem, I judge, I evaluate. What? Beyond even the words of the elven tongue to tell. Ooh. I mean, you talk about a line. 
not even Galadriel in her own tongue could praise you the way you deserve. Don't let uh, <laughs> Gimli see her. <laughs> Gimli just like might off try to take like your woman there. <laughs> like, okay. right? So, then the heart of Eowyn changed. It's like she climbed Mount Crumpet. Or else at last she understood it. Notice the difference. Did it change? Or had it always been that way? She just didn't know. Why wouldn't she have known? Is it because she paid more attention to Gimli than to her heart? I mean, could be. Her mind's eye was focused elsewhere. She wasn't paying attention to. Well, it's not just that. That's not just Aragorn. That's before Aragorn. Yeah. Petra and then Joplin. Um, well, like in the. According to Jeremiah, yeah. But David also says, Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That is, in the Christian tradition, the heart is also the seat of spirituality. I mean, Christ says, Look for the kingdom of heaven. They're like, Where? It's within. Okay. Jocelyn? Well, like she was in shadow for so long under Cream of Worm Cup. And then as soon as she was released from him and went straight into war, and like so she really hasn't had a chance to like be a woman, like That's experience those things for herself. To be herself. Okay. So we're told the heart of Aowen changed, or at last she understood it, and suddenly her winter passed, and the sun shone on her. Now is it Shown out there? Or is it from inside? And she says, I stand in Minas Anor, the tower of the sun. And behold, the shadow has departed. Now, the shadow is capitalized. Why? Because that's Sauron. But it's also the shadow within. Her shadow has departed. I will be a shield maiden no more, nor vie with the great riders, nor take joy only in the songs of slaying. So, not going to be a shield maiden, which means I'm not going to ride out to battle. I don't want to kill anybody. Okay? So it's all that. And she's not going to take joy only in the songs of slain. No, now what's she going to do? I will be a healer and love all things that grow and are not barren. If she's going to be a healer, then what's she going to be? What does she tell, not Sir Man, Aragorn, back before Aragorn takes the paths of the dead, <clears throat> that she will not be and is not. I am no mere serving woman. If you're going to be a healer, what do you have to do? You have to serve. That's it. You have to serve others. And if you serve others, what are you not doing for yourself? Serving yourself. Bingo. A colleague of mine who teaches this course too, now he's done the Harry Potter course in London with me as, as an assistant. He's kind of the one who brought this out. What do we see in this scene with Eowyn? This is her healing. This is her cure that Gandalf wants get, um, Gollum to find. Notice her heart was changed. That implies what? We're going to see this in one of the Harry Potter novels. Blows my mind every time. <clears throat> it's her conversion not in a Christian sense that is she doesn't fall down on her knees and go Hallelujah. oh Jesus come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior but it is a conversion it's a conversion from what killing being a soldier because if you're a soldier that's your job ultimately Okay, to healing, healing. being a bringer of life a giver of life 
a restorer of life. You don't get a more profound profound conversion than that. And she's also no longer seeking her own glory. Exactly. Faramir laughs. Good, because I'm not a king. Yet I will wed with the... Whoa, hold your horses there, <laughs> Captain. <laughs> kind of getting, you know, the cart before the horse. I mean, you haven't even asked her, you know. Yeah, let's get married. What? If it be, if it be her will. And if she will, then let's go. <laughs> let's cross the river. Happier days, okay? So they leave. Now we're going to skip a bunch. Rest of the steward of the king. We get a bunch of stupid songs, you know. Hail Frodo the Nine Fingers. I hate that person. Oh, right? boy. I sure didn't have nine fingers on my Next head. chapter. Um, many parties. All right? So, the reconstituted fellowship of a sort moves north. Okay? Aragorn's been crowned king. Gandalf finds a little sapling of the white tree. It's not been alive for thousands of years, but he finds one. Okay, Frodo puts the you know crown on Aragorn's hand. They're like, "All oh, hail, you know, see Kyle, you know, all night, right? Aragorn, etc." And they start going off north. Why? Because it's going to be the re-breaking. Only this time, it's going to be the final breaking. Okay, Aragorn goes with them. They get to Helm's Deep, and what happens? Legolas and Gimli break off. Why? They go there later, don't they? They're going to go through the caves. Why? Because they promised. Legolas would go Gimli into the caves, and then Gimli has to go with Legolas into Fangor. So they break off. Okay? What else? They keep going. They get to Isengard. <clears throat> Who's still there? Treebeard. Who's not still there? Yeah. And they're like, He's like, come on, Gandalf, you know me. I don't like to see anything in the cage. And Gandalf's like, oh, tree bear. He pulled the wool over your eyes. He still has what? The power of his voice. Now, that doesn't mean the smoothness of his elocution. It means the power of rhetoric. He can, he can be really persuasive. All right? So they find out he's gone. And then who do they meet along the way? Like two or three times, they run into Saruman. And what is he offered each time? A second chance. Only realize you can only be offered a second chance once because if it's offered again, it's a third, fourth, and fifth. And, and he's offered it many times. Right? And every time he turns it down. He's like, you know, I would like some weed. And Barry's like, here, I've got some. <laughs> Gives them some pipe weed and such. Okay. Weed about it. What else does... Man, I can't talk about that yet. Um, so they keep going. Let's see. They make their way to Rivendell. There's Bilbo. Okay. Chapter 7, Homeward Bound. Gandalf. Gandalf, Barry, Pippin, Frodo, Sam. Leave Rivendell to head towards the Shire. Okay. Where does Gandalf ditch him? Where? Prancing Pony. They get to the Prancing Pony. Okay. And yeah, we're going to have to spend a few minutes on Tuesday. They get to the Prancing Pony. They get ready to leave. And they hear stories about the Shire. Page 996. And Mary's like, well, we've got you with us. Things will soon be cleared up. Gandalf will make everything right. And Gandalf's like, about that. Do I want to? I'm with you at present, but soon I shall not be. I'm not coming to the Shire. You must settle its affairs yourselves. And then look at the next clause. This is what you have been trained for. Everything's to the That's kind of what Gandalf implies. Everything that's happened to you since September 22nd, the previous year, because this has all happened in less than a year. Okay. Everything that's happened is for this moment. It very much goes back to seeing the Grand View. Grandel sees the 
big picture. Let me get there. Right. How much change in the dollar for birth of just a single year <laughs> compared to like everything? <laughs> Compare September 10th, 2001 with September 12th, 2001. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, February, uh, December 6th, 1941 with December 8th, 1940. I, it doesn't take much. I mean, uh, not a little thing, but a single day can total. Imagine if today, for example, don't have time for this, but. You know, just yesterday, the CDC announced a uh, person in Northern California, I'm from Northern California, a person in Northern California came down with the coronavirus, and they don't know how. They don't know where that person got it from. Well, imagine with today, because state nationwide, there's something like seven, 800 people who are kind of in quarantine. They're at home. But imagine if tomorrow we find out, like happened in Italy just the other day, or South Korea last week, you go from 60 cases today to tomorrow we wake up and the news announces there's a thousand cases of coronavirus in the United States. 50 of them are in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And they're all me. Okay. I can guarantee you, if that were to happen, and they said 50 cases in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, one, local school systems are totally shut down. There's Why? No because, I mean, you don't play around with it, even though children aren't getting it. Oddly enough, <laughs> hopefully MTSU would say online classes. You know, okay, we'll stop. Yeah. We'll have to stop there. This stuff. I'll talk about it on Tuesday. It's just for the paper. Well, for the signing all, we just have to cite this book. Yeah, if yeah, but not everybody's using this one. Some people are using the free individual. So I have a question. Yeah. It's been bugging me for a while. If the ring just is uh, Sauron's power, then why did he separate it from himself? Because that, that just seems like... What do you mean? He didn't separate it from himself. I, well, it was well, cut off. No, no, no. He no, used no. his power to... Oh, yeah, I understand. Yes, but the, that when the ring was being made, like, wouldn't turning his power into a ring just be a, a good way to lose his power? What does every villain in every story... Tend to do. They monologue. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. fake the Incredibles. You got me monologuing. Why? Because they're arrogant. They're full of themselves. Sauron never thought anybody's going to get close to him. He was so full he was, of himself, he had to put some of his. He was, he was so full of himself, he had to put part of it in something else. Well, <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Was that he was so. Powerful that he wanted to remove from the power, so if anyone ever did try to take it or to get rid of him, he would have a good well, you're reading it within light of, of Harry Potter. Well, yeah, it's just, yeah, you know. It's a yeah. horror crux, that's what you're saying. Well, it's because if, I mean, with, in my opinion, both of these series being in the same class, we're supposed to sort of do that. Yeah. Now, not necessarily in the yes, paper, no, but I in don't, our minds. I don't think Tolkien has that in mind. Harry Johnson? Potter is a ring of power. Um, okay, so we no, referenced the Fellowship of the Ring, not mm -hmm. the book, but the Fellowship. The, the group. Yes. Um, Capitalized. Okay. Yeah, I would. Okay. I would. And when and I reference, and when you reference the book, italicized. Yeah. So, but when I reference the actual group, I was trying to trying to figure out: are they just like the Fellowship, or are they the Fellowship of the Ring? How? What should I name them? You could just use the Fellowship. I mean, that's clear that within the context. Okay. That's what it's referring to. All right. Thank you. Yep. And capitalize about the fellowship. Yeah, I would. I mean, it just makes it clearer. Okay. Thanks. Oh, time to freeze. All right. Have a good weekend. You too. Yeah. Oh, I think we're going to have to stop Thank mm -hmm. you.